Broadcasting from Salisbury University campus, this is WSDL Ocean City, NPR News Talk 90.7. Putting Delmarva first. Stay tuned for Delmarva Today with your host, Don Rush. It's over four miles long, but it changed the face of the eastern shore. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. Chesapeake Bay Bridge is a majestic sight as it swings up from Kent Island to the western shore, and there is talk of even a third span to accommodate the increasing traffic that flows across the bridge each day. It was a monumental feat that opened up the eastern shore, but it wasn't always welcomed in the land of pleasant living as those in Annapolis and Baltimore began planning for a span that cost around $41 million. Take a look at the planning construction impact of the bridge. We have on the phone with us John Paulson. He has, along with Aaron Paulson, produced a new book in the Images of America series called The Chesapeake Bay Bridge, and uh, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you, Don. Pleasure to be with you. So let me ask you this. Uh, how did you begin to get involved with this idea about the bridge? Uh, and I guess it was there was a documentary of some kind uh, a few years back. Yeah, well, I have two hats that I wear. Uh, one is an author and the other is a filmmaker. Predominantly, my work is as a filmmaker. And in 2011, I produced for Maryland Public Television Uh, a documentary, uh, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, Spanning the Bay. And that was really the spark. Uh, You know, we produced this hour-long documentary that aired on television. And in doing that project, you know, we do an immense amount of research. Uh, We scoured all the archives and discovered just this treasure trove, an immense amount of uh, footage and um, uh, photographs, especially of the whole, you know, birth and construction of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. So that was a really interesting time for me, and I was thinking, you know, with all these great photographs, why not uh, assemble them into a book and uh, really document it in that form, where you know you can pour over the pages, peer into the pictures, and really spend time with it to get a sense of, you know, just what it took to build this this mammoth structure. So take us back a bit. Uh, Before the bridge was built, what kind of situation did particularly the folks on the eastern shore find themselves in? Well, you know, before the bridge, uh, it's it's uh, going back to colonial times. It's boats, really, that were the the method of transport. If you wanted to get around the bay, you hopped on a boat typically. And, uh, you know, and, and in early times, it was relatively easy to get around. Most of the settlements were on the bay or up the tributaries of the bay, and so you know the bay was called a super highway. Um, great place to get around. Um, but as you know, the turn of the 20th century, uh, you know, in the early 1900s, automobiles came in, and uh, people wanted to get around in different ways, and the bay really became a, a barrier between the both sides of the state. So, um, you know, the eastern shore was a rural place, and if you wanted to get to the other side uh, for pleasure, shopping in Baltimore, if you wanted to get your uh, your melons or produce across to the markets, or if you wanted to get your seafood across to the markets, it became uh, increasingly difficult because um, trains made their way down the spine of the Delmarva Peninsula, and it made it a lot easier to ship goods and to move northward up to Wilmington and Philadelphia. And so, uh, you know, one of the great impetuses for the bridge, especially in the early 1900s, was from the western shore where um, the, the, you know, business folk, in, especially in Baltimore, saw all these fruits of the eastern shore moving northward and not westward to them as, as it had done. So that was kind of what the what the situation was, and and there were um, auto, if you were uh, uh, a vacationist and and you wanted to go across the bay in your automobile, typically well you had two choices: you could go up and around the long arduous route up to Elkton and back down, or you could hop on one of the many uh, automobile ferries that that went back and forth up until the day the Bay Bridge opened. So that's about what it was like. So when did the first notion of a bridge really come into view, particularly being taken seriously? 
Well, it really was with uh, um, the automobile culture. You know, in the early 1900s, as early as 1908, there's records of uh, proposals to the, uh, you know, Baltimore Manufacturers Association that a bridge be built. And I believe the first proposal for a bridge was um, way up in the north part of the bay, up well, up near Baltimore, but it would have been a uh, trolley line to get trolleys moving across. It wasn't even contemplating uh, automobiles. But uh, subsequent proposals, you know, then really turned to automobile bridges to get uh, people moving back and forth across. So from 1908 until the bridge opened in 1950, that's a good long time to, uh, uh, to yearn for a way to get across. Now, before we get into the bridge itself, uh, as you mentioned a moment ago, the ferry, particularly car ferries, were an important way to get from one side to the other. Tell me a little bit about it, because as I particularly as I looked at the, at the book, uh, it, it seemed to engender an entire uh, culture in terms of getting from one place to another and famous ferries and that kind of thing. It, it was, it seems to me, from the, you know, the research we've done and the people I spoke to. You know, we talked to old uh, ferry boat workers who were still around when we made our documentary. And uh, perhaps in the book it's a little romanticized, um, <laughs> but it seems that, uh, you know, riding the ferry was just part of Chesapeake Bay culture. You know, it's, it's what you did from about 1919 uh, when the fair, automobile ferries uh, began as I say, up until 1952 when the bridge opened. It's interesting that the, the day the bridge, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge opened is the day the ferries made their final runs and went out of commission. But for that 30-year period, um, you know, it was, um, it was a booming kind of, of operation, um, especially in the summertime. There was you know, kind of two key users of the ferry. There were the, the vacationers moving back and forth across. Uh, and in the summertime, the the demand was, was great. You know, those ferries were just jammed full of people trying to get to, you know, Rehoboth Beach and Ocean City, Maryland and other places, you know, Easton on the eastern shore. Um, but there were also uh, a, a number of truckers. You know, that's how commerce was done to get uh, produce and, and seafood across from the eastern shore to the western shore. There's a great story in the book of um, this guy, Ed White, who was a trucker, young guy, uh, might have been a teenager at the time, who had to drive from uh, Cambridge, Maryland, to Baltimore. And so he'd drive all the way up to the north point of Kent Island to Love Point, and he'd catch the ferry, the uh, Baltimore to Love Point ferry. Uh, it was the old Smokey Joe ferry if anybody uh, remembers that it was it was painted red and just belched billowing clouds of smoke as it went across and um, it was called the, the Josephine but everybody called it the Smoky Joe so Ed White would would drive up hit that ferry uh, in the middle of the night he'd catch like a 1 a.m. ferry he'd get over to Baltimore by 4 a.m. he'd drop off his seafood so the seafood would be fresh at the markets for the restaurants and the stores the next day and then catch a ferry back so that was kind of the story of of uh, how commerce worked uh, using the ferries but there were a number of lines you know there was Annapolis to Mattapeak Annapolis to Claiborne there was the Baltimore to Love Point ferry uh, and and there, if you took that Love Point, Baltimore to Love Point ferry, you could get off right there at Love Point and enjoy the accommodations of the Love Point Hotel, which had lo a live band and dances every Saturday night. And so you have that kind of culture where, where uh, young people are coming over from Baltimore just for the night to go dance at the Love Point Hotel. And, and then the country folk in, on Kent Island uh, meeting up with the city folk for a dance. Now, um, and and there were there were other uh, lines crossing too. There were steamship lines, for example, the uh, Baltimore to Tulchester Beach line in the summertime. You could hop on a steamer in the morning in Baltimore and be to Tulchester Beach in a couple hours. It was a straight shot straight across the bay from Baltimore. You could you know swim, fish, go on amusement park rides, have a picnic on the beach, and be be back by the evening. So it was a popular kind of excursion. So if you think of the, the Chesapeake Bay before the Bay Bridge, 
um, there was there were boats scurrying back and forth, you know, all the time, day and night. It's a busy, busy place. So how did they determine um, where they were going to locate the bridge? I mean, we were having that discussion now with, obviously, the uh, a possibility of a third span. What were they looking for, and how did they decide on what they finally landed on? Well, we didn't find any uh, business records or, or you know, uh, uh, state highway committee records that exactly explicitly points it out, but it's pretty obvious that um, the general location up in that part of the bay um, is due to Baltimore and uh, Baltimore, Annapolis, and Washington, D.C. That's the primary area that uh, they were going to be drawing from. And so the, the general area is uh, made, made sense. Now, the exact location, they, they placed the, ferry, the uh, bridge where it is because it was the shortest shot across. So from Sandy Point near Annapolis, over to Kent Island really was the, even though it was an extraordinary long run for, for any bridge of its kind in that day, it was the shortest shot they could go. And so that's why they chose that location. And in terms of the design, by the way, uh, I understand that they had to have a sharp angle when it came to allowing the, um, the shipping to, to move through the, the bay. Yeah, that's a, I love that story. It's, um, it's it's really what gives the bridge it's it's a je ne sais quoi you know anybody who's seen it the first thing you notice maybe it might be the 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 grand suspension section in the middle but you notice it has a, a curve and you wonder why you know why didn't we just shoot a straight shot across the bay well there's a shipping channel north south shipping channel for all the ships of the world coming up into the port of baltimore was a huge port at the time, very important port, shipping port on the East Coast at the time the bridge was built and remains so today. So the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who were the ultimate authority on the project, said whatever bridge you build must cross that shipping channel at a right angle so that ships coming through wouldn't have to go through sort of an angled opening in that channel um, for the safety of the bridge and the safety of the ship. So that was mandated by the Army Corps. So the bridge designers simply said, well, we'll take the bridge out of ways and then we'll insert a curve to ensure that it crosses at the, that right angle, crosses the shipping channel. So that's the reason for the great <clears throat> graceful curve that's a you know, central feature of that bridge. So describe for me the, the construction of this bridge. Um, because it was a massive undertaking. I understand it had really a number of different kinds of uh, types of bridging, as it were. Um, describe that, that effort, because it was quite a feat. Yeah, it was, and, and uh, a part of the feat is, is that it happened so fast. Uh, two and a half years of um, frenzied building. It's just remarkable how quickly the, the bridge went up. I'm, I'm astounded by it. Um, but it, it started... With looking the the uh, unsexy part of the bridge is under the water, and it started with looking at the foundations. You know what what is down at the bottom of the bay, and can it hold up a bridge? So, uh, a engineering company was hired to do test borings underneath the bay, and they discovered what you know we, we all I think know. It's a it's a soft, silty, muddy bottom. So establishing foundations for the piers that hold that bridge up was a great piece of the work, and it took about a year to, to do all that. And what they did is the bottom of the bay is soft, silt and mud. They dredged out that soft silt and mud to a depth of about 20 feet and then poured in sand and started from that for each pier. And then they drove piles down into the earth for each pier location. And on top of those piles, they might drill 40, 50, 100 piles deep down into the earth. On top of that, they poured concrete footings that rise up to about the surface of the bay. And those were the foundations. It took a year of work endlessly pounding, pounding, pounding of those pile drivers and, and the dredging 
just to establish the foundations. And I like to say that the, the Bay Bridge is sort of like an iceberg, you know, that's uh, 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 a minority percentage of it is what you see above water. Most of it is under the water in these foundations. So once we have foundations established, firm foundations, then we can build the superstructure on top of it. And, you know, that consisted of um, many kinds of bridges. And I thought that was interesting for me to learn. Uh, You know, I'm a civilian, not an engineer. I wasn't really aware. And uh, they had a choice to make of what kind of, of bridge to build. And so... Uh, in this four slightly over four mile structure from one shore to the other it goes from one type of bridge to another beam span girder span deck girders through cantilevers deck cantilevers and um and then of course in the center the grand suspension section which we all you know can see and is familiar to us it's matter of fact, I was talking about the suspension. One of the things that struck me was, I, I guess it, it was described almost as like a, a spider web with the, these men working high in the air, uh, which, I mean, I don't have acrophobia, but uh, I, I, it would give me pause. Tell me a little bit about that, because the, the men who uh, worked on it had a little different view. Well, right. This is 1949 to 1950. And times were (laughs) different, and the way the work was performed was certainly different. And um, it was dangerous. There's no question about it. Um, They didn't really use safety nets and tie-offs and lanyards. I mean, one one guy who uh, was a a young young engineer on the project said that they were told to tuck their uh, cuffs of their pants in and tuck their shoelaces into their shoes as safety measures. <laughs> so <laughs> that only gets you so far. I mean, you still got to walk out on beams, you know, high 100, 200, 300 feet above the water to, to perform some of this work. So um, there, were, there were four deaths that are reported on the bridge. I'm not sure whether those are, you know, real accurate numbers or not. There, there could be more. Uh, some people just fell uh you know they they'd take a step where they they thought they had sure footing and and there wasn't and there they went there's a uh, another story that uh, an engineer told us about a guy who missed his step and went down and fortunately hit the water and you know they looked down and there was this big welling of, of the water and and you know after a few harrowing seconds a head popped up and bobbed up and a, and a boat ran out to get him and the guy was okay <laughs> But still, these things, these kinds of things, happened. Uh, there's there's photographs in the, in the book. Uh, it's interesting. A a Russian magazine at the time came to the Bay Bridge. So it, it's interesting that that people around the world were taking note of this this you know engineering public work. So a Russian magazine comes with a photographer, and there's some of the best photographs that we have of the men and how they worked. And they're high up on these uh, on this steelwork, high up, 100, 150 feet up. They're eating lunch. They're walking on beams with no tie-offs, no no lanyards, no safety methods of any kind, and they're just doing their work. So it's kind of remarkable to see that. So tell me about the day that it finally got uh, christened. Uh, as a matter of fact, this was uh, actually it's now named after the governor who first started it. I think it was called Lane's Folly at one, one point. Tell me what that moment was like when they finally opened this thing up, because uh, lots of people were there. Yeah, it was a, it was a grand day. Opening day was July 30th, 1950. And people of the state had really waited. They had waited a long time. People wanted this bridge for 40 years, and um, it, it uh, as an aside, the bridge might have been built, probably would have been been built maybe a decade earlier, if not for World War II, because in the late 30s, you know, there were plans drawn up, and the legislature was, you know, was, was looking into it and how to finance it, et cetera, and they even had plans, and then World War II came along, and, you know, of course, everything was put on hold. And so post-war, you know, the war's over in 1945. By 1950, the bridge is up, 
you know, it's still just r- remarkable to me how quickly it all happened. So on July 30th, 1950, there's a, a you know, a grand celebration planned with uh, opening ceremonies on one shore and then a parade across to the other shore. We begin on the western shore and we p- parade across to the eastern shore. And there's thousands of people there. All the uh, military branches are represented. There's the Star Spangled Banner. There's Maryland, My Maryland is sung. There's even Francis the Talking Mule, if anybody <laughs> is old enough yes. to remember that from uh, the, the famous Hollywood quadruped. Uh, so it was, it was quite an affair. Um, Governor Lane William Preston Lane, Jr., who really initiated and and championed the project in the late 1940s, was present, along with his successor, Governor Theodore McKeldin, who, you know, carried the project through. Both of them were there uh, to cut ribbons, and they sat in in, uh, open open, uh, limos and and rode across at a snail's pace, rode across the bridge and got to the very top, and had a view of the Chesapeake Bay and both shores, eastern and western, that no one had had prior to that moment. And uh, you know, they they took in the view, and it was just a it was just a great day. After the the parades, the bridge was open, and there's an interesting gentleman uh, at the time who called himself Mister First, and he prided himself on being first at many things, one of which was going over new bridges as they were built. And so he had waited in line at the toll gate in his car for, uh, I think, two or three days. There's film footage of him shaving using the the rearview mirror of his car. He lived in his car so just to be first in line. And there's a photograph of uh, Governor McKeldin handing him the first uh, toll pass and being the first car over so uh, so while uh, while the parade had gone over and, and other cars were technically the first, Mister First believed that the first paying toll customer was the legitimate first over the bridge, and and over he went. So it was that kind of an event that drew that kind of uh, attention, and 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 immediately after it opened, just waves of traffic, probably mostly curious sightseers, coming down to the bridge to drive over. Uh, but it was um, it was a big day for Maryland. Now, apparently, uh, not everybody in the Eastern Shore was happy about this. I ran across one of the quotes that you have from a citizen says about the bridge likely to produce shudders in those who know and love the shore's present open spaces and unspoiled road size. Hordes of tourists, vacationers, and out of for the t- day motorists do not bring blessings for the landscape. They bring hot dog stands, taverns. Billboards, nightclubs, barbecues, tourist cabins, automobile graveyards, gasoline filling stations, and gambling joints. Uh, Not everybody was happy with this. And I suspect, as a matter of fact, I talked to people who, on the shore who say maybe that was a mistake. (laughs) Tell me a little bit about that. I'm sure that, uh, (laughs) that, I mean, this is the struggle of all change, isn't it? Um, You know, there was no question that the state was going to be changed on both sides. And um, I think most of the change really happened on the eastern shore, and the bridge brought it about. Um, And and those who took advantage of uh, economic opportunities there, I think, were were pleased, and others who liked the seclusion and the character of, of the eastern shore were probably not so pleased. Um, there's a there's a poignant story. Um, well, let me back up a second. Sure. The, you know, when you think about the Bay Bridge coming in, this four mile structure, that was only <clears throat> one one element, the, the primary element of a larger project, which involved <clears throat> seven or more miles of new roads, road widening, and road improvements. So, of course. The, the, if, if you think about it from west to east, traffic coming over from Baltimore, Washington, Annapolis, uh, you know, new highways had to be made, and the existing Route 50 highway had to be widened into this four-lane thing. 
Um, now the bridge is going to rise up over the bay and land on Kent Island. Well, what's going to happen there? You know, all this traffic has to go somewhere, so Route 50 there is widened as well. And um, there's a poignant story of um, a, a woman whose grandmother lived on a farm on Kent Island. And, you know, they, they came and said, we're sorry to say, the, the road's coming through. And, uh, you know, she stayed as long as she could. But, uh, but when the road graders came and the cement started to be poured and she couldn't go from one side of her farm to the other, well, you know, it's time to go. And so that's what that's what happened on the eastern shore. And, you know, anybody who lives there can see the impact of the bridge on that Route 50 corridor. Uh, it's just um, commerce and uh, development almost all the way from the bridge to open Ocean City. You know, not quite, but yeah. but uh, it's it's pretty thick. So that change transformed that bridge transformed the eastern shore in in monumental ways and uh, i'm sure not everybody was happy about it <laughs> um you know i think the planners of the bridge knew that ocean city was a huge draw for the people of the western shore and it was difficult to get to i mean only the most intrepid of traveler would would go and um as one hotel owner there an old hotel owner whose father had been in the business from the 30s you know kind of saw the changes in the business that in the old days people would come down for weeks and because it was hard to get to and so and so you know if it took a a, a long grueling day or two to get to, um from somewhere on the western shore down to ocean city well you're not going to turn around the next day and go back home, you know, like people do now. So um, it really enabled this speedy, fast way to get to um, destinations all over the eastern shore. Well, let me just break in there because uh, we could go on, I'm sure, for another half hour. A fascinating look, by the way. I recommend it. Uh, as you say, a lot of great, uh, great photographs in there. It's like peering back in time. Uh, we've been speaking with John Paulson, who, along with Aaron Paulson, has produced a new book in the Images of America series. It's called The Chesapeake Bay Bridge, and we appreciate you taking the time to uh, chat with us. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, Don. This has been Del Marva Today. I'm Don Rush. Thanks for listening. And there you have it. Thank you for watching Delmarva Today, a production of Delmarva Public Radio. Production and audio engineering by Chris Rank. Hosted by Don Rush. For podcasts, visit delmarvapublicradio.net or subscribe to the Delmarva Today podcast on iTunes. Delmarva Today can now be seen on Pack 14.